Hey there everybody, this is Tiger Eye Gaming, and this is everything you need to know about Minecraft 1.19, the wild update. In this video, I'm planning to give a brief overview of all the significant changes that have occurred in Minecraft 1.19, ranging from these guys right here, the LA, to the deep dark and everything that comes along with it, like these ancient cities and the warden, to mangrove swamps, as well as these goat horns that I have right here in my first inventory slot. Now, as you can tell, we are currently in the deep dark and particularly in an ancient city, so we're gonna start with these. As I'm sure many of you know, the deep dark is a new underground overworld biome that was technically intended to be part of Caves and Cliffs. So in a way, this update 1.19 is kind of Caves and Cliffs part three, but the developers just wanted to take a little bit more time to make sure they got this biome right. So instead it's been delayed until now, Minecraft 1.19. Now I'm taking a lot of this information directly from the wiki. So if you want to know a little bit more, you can always feel free to head over there. But the deep dark is an overworld biome that typically generates underground beneath areas with a low erosion value. That's what the wiki says. So that often uh, ends up being underneath mountain peaks or plateaus. Typically, this biome is also pretty dimly lit. As you can tell by that little icon in the top right of the screen, I currently have night vision, but if I were to be in here without night vision, it would be really, really dark. Really, the, the only sources of light under here would be these torches. I, I'm not sure the glow lichen really spawns in. It, it really does get nice and atmospheric here if you don't have the night vision effect. Along with these ancient cities in the distance over there, which I promise we'll get to, these biomes are often covered in blocks like right here, the skulk, as well as the skulk catalysts, and the skulk sensors, along with skulk shriekers. Now, I, I'm going to avoid the shriekers for the moment, since in the course of setting this up, I've already triggered them a couple times, and we'll learn why that's a bad thing in a second. But these blocks right here are the typical ones that you'll see in the deep dark. I've gone ahead and lined these blocks up, with the notable exception of the Skulk Shrieker again, just to give you a little bit more info about each of them. This one right here is the Skulk Block. As you can see, it, it has a texture that kind of pulses like that, which I find really cool. I honestly didn't realize that, how, uh, how obvious it was until just now. I like that. But yeah, the Skulk Block is a largely decorative block that you'll find down here, often covered by Skulk Veins. The, those are the uh, little vine guys right here. And much like uh, these other two blocks right here, if I go ahead and switch back into survival, the main tool that you can break them with is the hoe, although they will break with anything. So as you can see, there you go, I just broke it with my hand and it was pretty easy. Technically the hoe is a little bit faster, but uh, you know, you can break it with anything. You could also hopefully tell there that we actually got a little bit of experience from that, and uh, I'll explain why that is in a second. But yeah, you do get a little bit of experience from breaking skulk blocks without silk touch. As you can see, it's not a huge amount, but it is a bit. Now, you don't necessarily get that from the vine blocks, which makes sense, so those are the skulk veins. But next up, we have the skulk sensors right here. So in general, what these skulk sensors do is they pick up vibrations from within a 9 block radius around them. If they also happen to be within a, a certain distance of a skulk shrieker, and the noise is made by a player, they'll then take that vibration and pass it on to the skulk shrieker. If the noise is significant enough, the skulk shrieker will then make a loud noise, and the warden will become one step closer to spawning in, or, if you've disturbed it enough times, the warden may even spawn in at that point. Other than that, though, if the skulk shriekers aren't around a skulk sensor, they're pretty harmless. You know, you, you can see those little particles emanating to them, and they actually emanate a redstone signal, which is pretty cool. They interact uniquely with comparators. I've gone ahead and placed a comparator down here just to show you, and yep, as you can see there by these two... Uh, redstone torches if you will lighting up on the comparator it lights up whenever it senses a vibration from either the player or from that allay that i think might still be roaming around here but yeah as you can tell whenever it detects a signal and that little particle goes over to the skulk sensor it'll light up that redstone and the redstone signal that comes from the comparator will actually be relatively strong to where the vibration emerges from. So if I make a vibration right here, basically right on top of the skulk sensor, the redstone signal will be stronger than if I were over here and the uh, skulk sensor heard me. One final thing to note about the skulk sensor is that they interact uniquely with wool. Basically, wool has an occluding factor, which means that if you place it down like this, the skulk sensor actually won't detect it as opposed to other blocks where for example, if I break this block right here, and sorry, the LA is confounding this a little bit since the sensor is picking up some of its movements, but if I break this block right here, there you go. See, it lit up very strong because that came from right near the block. But if I break this wool block right here, yep, as you could tell, nothing happened there. Let me go ahead and do it again as soon as it goes dark. See, there you go. Nothing happened. And if I place some wool blocks down, 
nothing again. But if I move around on the wall, it will not pick up those vibrations. Same thing if an item gets dropped on the wall. See, there you go. Yep, it wasn't picking up those items being dropped on the wall. And finally, I believe it's the same thing if you throw wool down just on the ground like that. Okay, never mind. I guess not. But but basically, wool acts as an occluding factor. So if you want a skulk sensor to not really pick up your vibrations, you can also do that. And it should be a lot less sensitive to any sort of movements that happen if wool is surrounding it. Much like the other skulk items we discussed, this block can also be broken with just your hand or with really any tool, but the hoe is technically the tool of choice, and similarly again to the others, if you break it on a tool without silk touch, it'll just drop experience. So there you go, that dropped a little bit more experience than the uh, plain old skulk block, but not too, too much. Finally, this guy right here is the skulk catalyst, and this guy uniques pretty interactively with the player and other mobs. Just to give an example, oh, wait, that was a bad idea, actually. <laughs> Back to creative. Just to give an example of how this works, I went ahead and placed a few more Skulk Catalysts down on the ground. And if I kill these zombies, sorry, Mr. Zombie, just gonna get you there. See? There you go. We actually, we, uh, we got two new achievements in this, and the relevant one to what I'm talking about now is It Spreads. If you kill a mob near uh, these patches of Skulk Catalysts, Instead of that experience going to you, it'll actually go to the Skulk Catalysts, and it'll generate new Skulk Blocks. Now, as you can see from this little clump being generated over here, it's mostly Skulk Blocks and Skulk Veins. However, there is also a chance that it'll generate things like Skulk Sensors and Skulk Shriekers. Just to give a little bit of a clearer demonstration, let's go ahead and do it again with this man right here. And see, there you go, you, you saw that little animation of the new Skulk Blocks generating in. Now they do have to be a certain distance from the Skulk Catalysts in order for this to work, so let's see. I think we've pushed him close enough. So there you go, he did generate there. But if we happen to do it over here, let's say, I think this may be just too far. Okay, I'm actually not sure if anything generated right there. But yeah, the, the point stands. Once you get a certain number of blocks away from the Skulk Catalysts, it'll no longer have that same effect. Alright, I've gone ahead and just checked on the wiki, and apparently it's within an 8 block radius. That's how close a mob needs to be to uh, for the experience to go towards generating new skulk blocks. In addition, the wiki also tells you that there is a 9% chance of new skulk sensors spawning in as a, as a result of uh, experience going towards these skulk catalysts, and there is a 1% chance of a skulk shrieker spawning in. So, ultimately, those ones are a little bit more rare than the skulk sensors and the skulk veins. In fact, they're a lot more rare, but it's not impossible, so just be... Just be wary of that, you know, if you're in the deep dark and you're trying to avoid triggering the warden, just be wary of uh, killing too many mobs nearby these skull catalysts. But yeah, finally, this block can also be broken just with your hand. As you can see right here, it's a little bit slower, but it will eventually break. Oh, forgot that you were there. Let's get one more demonstration. Alright, see that was a pretty strong one. Oh, and we got a potato. Okay, we're switching back. But yeah, basically, long story short, the hoe is the tool of choice for these guys. And similar to the other guys, it drops experience. And unless you use a silk touch tool, it will not drop the block itself. It's a very cool update to explore, and there certainly is a lot to it. So I'll try to cover as much as I can, but I won't be able to cover everything. That being said, another one of the things that we can get to covering is this big, big structure right here, the ancient city. These palace-like structures are similar to end cities in that they're made up of smaller structures that generate next to each other to, uh, to form completely independent ancient cities. I.e., they're not like jungle temples or uh, desert temples where you'll see the exact same structure every single time. They're kind of modular, and so they just they, they, they generate in different ways every single time. There are, you know, a certain number of specified structures, and if you're interested in getting into those, I do suggest going over to the Minecraft wiki and checking them out for yourself, or honestly, I kind of recommend just exploring the structure yourself. Yeah, it's a little bit scary, but you know, as long as you're prepared to fight the Warden, which again we'll get into, it really is a cool new experience in the game. Now, one of my favorite things anytime a new structure is added into the game is seeing what the loot is like. So this right here is just the first random chest I, I happen to come upon. And okay, it looks like this is decently representative because we've got some coal. We also have a compass in here. And we have two potions of regeneration, that's really cool, along with an enchanted diamond hoe. That's really nice. I'm going to go ahead and fill this chest up now with the typical loot table to uh, show you some of the things that you can typically get from these chests. Alright, so this right here is the list of potential loot that you can get from these chests. Luckily, it actually just fully fits into, into a chest, but yeah, there is some pretty impressive loot here. 
At the top, in the more abundant category, we have coal, bones, soul torches, as well as books, potion of regen, and then any sort of enchanted book. You get a little bit further along, and then you have things like a disc fragment of the music disc 5, which I'll get into in a second, along with echo shards. Again, I'll get into in a second. But you also have things like amethyst shards, glow berries, skulk, candles, bottles of enchanting, the skulk sensors, a specifically swift sneak enchanted book, which is a little bit less common than the other enchanted books apparently, but you can still find them down here. You can also find enchanted iron leggings, skull catalysts, compasses, music discs like 13 and cat, a lead, a name tag, a saddle, an enchanted diamond hoe with a little bit of durability taking off, an enchanted diamond legging, and like I mentioned, an enchanted golden apple, and the other side music disc. Now, just to briefly get into the new items that are included in here, first you have these disc fragments, which are for the music disc 5. Now, they're not specifically aligned or anything, all you need to do is find 9 of these guys right here, and you're able to craft that into one music disc number 5. Let me go ahead and give you an example of that right now. We will do a disc fragment, and let's just get a stack of those, and then grab up a crafting table just to, sh just to show you. So boom, we place that down, nine of these into a group like that, and boom, that makes the music disc five. Next up from the disc fragments, we have the echo shard, which is used to create the recovery compass. Similarly to the uh, disc fragments, you need a number of these echo shards right here, so let's go ahead and grab a stack. And what you need to do is place a compass in the middle like this, then you place echo shards all around it, and that allows you to create a recovery compass. Now, as you can see right here, the compass is kind of just, you know, messing around in my inventory since I haven't died yet. And that's actually the purpose that this compass serves. It points you to the most recent place where you died in your world. Now, I know it's not necessarily an entirely game-changing tool, but that is a pretty useful thing. I've always thought that it was kind of silly that the uh, typical compass just points you to your spawn point, because in reality, there's nothing that's necessarily tying you to your spawn point in the world. Maybe your home base is hundreds or thousands of blocks away. So you know what? I think this is a useful tool, even if the Echo Shards don't necessarily set the world on fire. Both of those items that we just talked about, the Disc Fragment and the Echo Shard, have a 29.8% chance of spawning in these chests. And what that means is on average, you'll have to look through 3.4 chests to find them. Again, as far as I'm concerned, that's really not bad, and it does provide you with a pretty solid chance to get these new items, the Recovery Compass, and the Music Disc 5. Now, moving along from these loot chests a little bit, as you can see here, if we fly over this ancient city a little bit, they're typically mostly comprised of Deep Slate along with some Skulk that's, you know, kind of skulked its way onto the main platform. You also will see a lot of wool generating here along the walkways, which makes sense because uh, it gives you, the player, an opportunity to kind of walk along these top areas without necessarily making too much noise and alerting the warden. There are also a few other blocks that'll spawn in in specific structures within the ancient city, but I'll leave those to you to discover mostly. The one that I do want to touch on over here is this block, which is called Reinforced Deep Slate. If I go ahead and use my pick block tool, that is what the block looks like. We can go ahead and see it from above. That's pretty nice. Yep, pretty solid. It's got a cool little texture. To me, it sort of gives uh, hardened terracotta vibes, you know, having this very specific pattern. Reinforced Deep Slate is also unique in that it cannot be obtained in survival mode. You can stay in there with a pickaxe, you know, netherite, enchanted, everything, and you can keep chipping away at it for as long as you want. I believe it takes around 80 some seconds to break, but no matter what, even if you have Silk Touch, you cannot obtain this block in survival. This block also cannot be pushed by a piston, but it is also completely resistant to anything like TNT, or creeper blasts, any sort of explosion. So it's a, it's a very unique block. I did also see a lot of speculation that the way it generates in these ancient cities kind of looks like a portal of some sort. Personally, I don't necessarily believe that it's going to lead to anything big in the future, but it hasn't stopped some people from speculating, and who knows? In the future, this could be a great way to introduce some new dimension if that's where Mojang is thinking of taking the game. Finally, just an extra little thing to note, there is also a structure in these ancient cities called the Icebox, which can generate with a slightly different loot table. However, I haven't really been able to find it yet, and uh, you know what, I think I'll go ahead and leave that one to, to you all to explore. That one typically generates with items like snowballs, packed ice, baked potatoes, golden carrots, and some suspicious stew. But yeah everyone, with that said, I think we've just about covered everything that I wanted to mention in these ancient cities, so I think it might be time to take on that incredibly dangerous task of summoning the warden. Let's go ahead and give it a go. I'm just going to go ahead and try to make some noise right next to this skulk shrieker. 
Okay, Warden draws close. And I, oh, I'm i not sure if you could hear it in the background there, but there was a little dun-dun, like the sound of a heartbeat. Oh, there we go. Oh my god. <laughs> so that is how the Warden comes out. He emerges like that. It is terrifying. Okay, and has he has he noticed me even though I'm in creative? I'm not quite sure. Okay, well I even though I'm in creative and he's not gonna come for me, <laughs> this is still very, very scary. And I think he's actually going for that allay. So you know what? Let's just take a second to observe. Oh man. Oh he hit the allay, but the allay's still alive. Okay. That is impressive, but oh my god, this man is so fast. And as you can see right there, he's got his sonic boom attack. So that way, even if you try to pillar away so that he can't necessarily reach you with a melee attack. Oh no. Man. RIP LA, but that just shows you how strong this guy is. To get a little bit more into the details of how the Warden works, the Warden is technically a completely blind mob that is summoned by these Skulk Shriekers right here in the deep dark. I believe how it works is, you have three chances, and on the third time that a Skulk Shrieker shrieks, you'll go ahead and get that subtitle in the bottom right there, Warden Emerges. And, you know, he'll typically, if it's in a, uh, a place right like this, you know, where there's just some deep slate on the ground, he'll emerge out of the ground, there'll be some kind of a, a cracking noise, and then he'll just, you know, pop up, and if you are nearby and making some noise, he'll start beating on you. But in general, the way that he finds you in order to start using his attacks is by vibrations. So if you're making noise nearby him, like that Alay was, he will sense them. Oh. Okay, and well, this guy actually wanted to go ahead and show us a, a different thing that the Wardens do. When they return into the ground, if you haven't bothered them for long enough, I believe it's 60 seconds. If they go 60 seconds without hearing any vibrations and being made angry, they will burrow back into the ground just like that. But yeah, as I was saying when he was out, if they sense vibrations, and you see the particles fly to them, the same way particles kind of fly to these guys right here, then he'll start getting angrier and angrier, and he'll start getting a better idea of where you, the player, are at. Also, in the course of checking the wiki there, I do just want to correct myself, it's actually four times. So, you get three chances, and then on the fourth time that the Skulk Shrieker shrieks, that's when the Warden will emerge. But yeah, the Warden is essentially designed to be a kind of mob that you don't want to fight at any costs. In the Java edition at least, it is the highest health mob in the game. It is very, very difficult to beat. Its sonic boom attack goes straight through any armor and any enchantments you, that you have on. So even if you want to pillar away to get away from its melee attack, it's still going to be able to do huge, huge amounts of damage to you. Basically, the way it's designed, it's a mob that you want to get away from as fast as possible, not one that you necessarily want to take on. Even if you have full diamond or full netherite armor enchanted, it's going to be able to take you on pretty easily. The Warden has 150 hearts of health. On hard mode, the Warden's melee attack does 45 damage, meaning 22 and a half hearts, which is obviously a huge amount. You know, even if armor, you know, netherite with protection 5 reduces that a little bit, it's still going to be very, very potent. And its ranged attack, that scream that you saw it doing to the LA, that actually does 7.5 full hearts of damage on hard mode. And that's, you know, that, that has nothing to do with the amount of armor you're wearing. Armor, enchantments, nothing protects against that except the resistance effect. Now I'm going to go ahead and spawn this guy in one more time just to give you oh, another example of how it works. Oh, there he is. Okay, he was on the outside of all these skull blocks. But yeah, the warden will not be damaged by lava. So I'll just go ahead and show you that real quick. Yeah, see? Unaffected. Does not care. All it does is boost him. <laughs> so he really does not mind. But yeah, once they set their, uh, their eyes on something, it is very, very difficult to get away from them. But one way that you can distract the warden if you're playing in survival is to throw projectiles. So what I'm going to do is aim right over here. And see? It caught that vibration, so it's going to walk on over real quick. So if you need to distract it, say you want to run this way, you know, you're running this way, you take a snowball and you throw it in this direction, you'll be able to, to get a bit of distance away from the warden. However, if you throw too many snowballs or projectiles of any sort in quick succession, that's going to make the warden even angrier, and he's going to be able to sniff you out with more accuracy. So just be wary of throwing more than two projectiles in less than five seconds. 
Essentially, the details of how the Warden's anger works are a little bit complicated to get into right now. If you want to know more about them, you can totally check the wiki. But essentially, if the Warden's anger value gets too high, it's going to be able to pathfind to the player no matter what. You know, even if it's supposed to be quote unquote blind, it's going to be able to sniff you out if you throw too many projectiles. It's going to feel those vibrations and it's going to know where you are. So you have to be wary of letting the warden get too angry, you know, throwing too many projectiles, getting too close, or hitting it, you know, in survival mode. Those are all essentially great ways to get it to notice you and start chasing you with reckless abandon. The final thing I want to note here is that its anger value decays over time. So even if it's very angry, but it hasn't quite sussed out exactly where you are yet, don't fret, just grab some wool, pillar away from it if you can, and then try and try to make your way away as quietly as you can. See, there you go, sneak 100. Not sure exactly what that advancement is, but I'm sure it's related to sneaking away from the warden because it won't hear these vibrations on wool, much like the skulk sensors don't hear vibrations on wool. So if the warden is very angry at you, but it doesn't quite know exactly where you are, just wait it out. Hopefully you should be able to get its anger value down to zero, and 60 seconds after that, the warden will despawn and crawl back into its little hole. And there you go, you can see it right there. It's, <laughs> it looks really funny, especially from the back. I do love that animation. But yeah, the warden is now back underground. And I think at this point, there is only one thing left to do. Go to survival mode and try to fight it. But alright everyone, as I switch my way to spectator mode and finally leave the deep dark in this ancient city, one final thing to mention about these ancient cities, the nice thing about them is that mobs do not spawn in ancient cities, so thankfully you don't have to worry about a creeper blowing up and you know triggering a skull shrieker or a skeleton shooting you over and over making a ton of noise, luckily you don't have to worry about any of that. The only hostile mob you'll find there is the warden if you have the misfortune to spawn it in. So honestly, if you're prepared, those biomes, I don't think, are all that bad. If you're not prepared, if you don't know how to deal with the warden, yeah, you, you probably are in for a lot of trouble. But if you are prepared, if you have those projectiles and some wool, or just are generally prepared to sneak around everywhere, you should be able to get away without losing your life to the warden. Well, now that we are back on the surface where it's nice and sunny out here, I think a great next thing to show you is what this guy can do. And this guy, he is the reason we have a certain new item in this game called the Goat Horn. So I'm going to go ahead and go here to the creative menu. As you can see, there are eight different types of horns. So I think what I'm going to do is just clear out my inventory a little bit and grab one of each of these. So let's go three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So let's just go ahead and uh, try these guys out. <laughs> I gotta say, I really like those goat horn noises. I'm not someone who typically cared all that much about, you know, sounds in Minecraft. I actually spent many years playing without the sounds and only using the subtitles. Ooh, that was a nice jump. But I do have to admit, I do love all these sounds, you know, from from this guy at the end here, Yearn, all the way to Ponder, like, I do like the sounds. It's a little interesting that they, you know, generate in eight different goat horns, but I think it's an interesting enough mechanic, you know? Speaking of those eight different horns, the way that you get any of these eight horns is by a goat ramming one of these blocks that I placed right here. Emerald ore, coal ore, iron ore, stone, any of these logs, you know, oak, uh, spruce, mm, birch, jungle, acacia, dark oak, the new mangrove, uh, I'm assuming at least, and then packed ice. Any of these blocks right here, if you see a goat ramming it, when it rams, it's going to drop a goat horn on release. And it's actually not dependent on the block that it hits. I thought that too, but it's actually just a random chance. 
The way it works is, normal goats will have a chance of dropping either ponder, sing, seek, or feel if they ram one of these blocks. Those four horns also have a 100% chance of spawning in pillager outpost chests. However, the final four, admire, call, yearn, and dream, can only be obtained from the screaming goat specifically. For those of you who are unaware, the screaming goats are a kind of subset of normal goats who, well, scream. <laughs> so they make different noises in game, which is also why they drop those four different horns. Again, that's admire, call, yearn, and dream. And again, if you want to learn any uh, more information about those specific horns or how, you know, how to get them, how to get the goats to ram these items, feel free to check the wiki or other people's videos. So far, I've had some trouble trying to replicate a scenario where the goats end up ramming one of these blocks, but, you know, I, I'm sure that plenty of people out there who are smarter than I am have figured out a way to do it. One final thing to note about goats ramming these blocks is that these blocks have to be spawned in naturally. So, i.e. what I've done right here now, this would not work. They have to be spawned in natural blocks. So, so you'd need some packed ice up at the very top of a mountain. You'd need one of these blocks to come in a tree. You know, any of these wood blocks that a goat would have to be ramming a naturally spawned tree. Or any of these ore blocks, they have to be naturally generated ore or stone blocks. Again, that is a little bit difficult to farm up. But you know what, I like that. I like that these horns are a little bit difficult to uh, obtain. And you know what? Go ahead and drop in the comments. If you're still watching this video, go ahead and let me know. Which of these goat horns is your favorite? Personally, I I find it kind of hard to choose. I do sort of like Seek. Let me hear that one again. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. I feel like one of them is the noise that's used for a raid. I don't remember exactly which one. I, uh, again, if you know that, drop it in the comments. I'm sure I could go ahead and look it up online. <laughs> But yeah, I just, I love these goat horns. It's such a cool addition. Well, all right, everyone. Now that we've taken some time to cover the deep dark and a little break to cover the goat horn, I think it's about time that we hit up the new, the other new biome, excuse me, in 1.19, the Mangrove Swamp. So the Mangrove Swamp is a new variant of swamp biome with slightly more teal water, which we can go ahead and just try out if we drop down here. Ooh, yeah. See, look at that. We got some nice fishies, and we are in the mangrove swamp water. So this is what it looks like as compared to some of the other ones. And yeah, you will see some tropical fish spawning around here because this is a slightly warmer type of biome. You'll often find it by biomes like a jungle right there or, you know, maybe even a savanna or a desert, which, yep, there we go. We got a savanna in the distance. So it's a slightly warmer type of swamp biome. Obviously, the main difference as compared to a normal swamp is that this biome has these long ranging mangrove trees instead of the normal oak trees that you'll find in a lot of other swamp biomes. Now these guys, if you go ahead and drop on down to the floor here, they do a really good job of covering the floor. Honestly, being in a mangrove swamp for the first time really reminded me of being in a dark oak forest because you have these long rangy roots, which we'll get to in a second. But you have these long roots and just these leaves that cover so much of the sky. It it really does feel a lot like being in those highly covered dark, dark oak forests. Now, as for the mobs that spawn in these biomes, these mobs will have frogs and slimes spawn in them, but they actually won't have animals like the, uh, the cows, chickens, pigs, sheep that spawn in the normal swamp biomes. So that's also another thing that makes this biome a little bit unique. Although, ooh, apparently these trees can spawn with beehives. I honestly didn't know that until now. That's very cool. Nice, that, that's a cool little spot for a beehive too. But yeah, anyway, to, to get back on track, what we have here on the mangrove trees is obviously a mangrove leaves, and we also have the mangrove wood. So let me go ahead and get my way in there. Mangrove log. So as you can see, if I place it down, it's got that nice red texture right in the middle here. So you got that a little bit of a, uh, well, slightly darker than normal oak, I would say, is the, uh, the bark. That's the outside, but then if I go ahead and grab an axe to strip it down, let's grab a diamond axe. Look at that, it's so red, it's, it's very interesting. I do like that color. I am all for more colorful and interesting wood being added to the game. Of course, along with that new type of log being added to the game comes a variety of different new items. We have the mangrove planks, which are looking nice and red. We have the propagule, which I'll get to. We also have these roots, which I'll get to as well. And then we have uh, muddy mangrove roots, along with the strip mangrove log, which we saw. The uh, mangrove wood and strip mangrove wood, which is just the bark on all sides. And then we have the uh, slab, fence, you know, stairs, button, pressure plate, door, trap door. Now, I do want to take a look at these guys since they are unique for each type of wood. Then we also have the fence gate, and we do have the boat. 
and the sign along with the boat with chest, which is an entirely new item in the game. So let's go ahead and time set day real quick, and then we'll take a look. This is what the mangrove door looks like. Oh, I like that design. I like that design. There's no uh, transparent spot in it, which is cool. We have the mango trap door. That does have a little transparent spot in the middle, but I do still like the design. And then finally, we have the mangrove boat with chest. Let's go ahead and take a look at what that is like. And there you go. That is the first time I've ever placed a boat with chest down in Minecraft. So what happens if I right click it? Okay, there you go. Nice, able to just roam around here. So I do want to know what happens if I shift right click. And there you go, that is how you access the boat with chest. Very, very cool. So as you can see, I now have a stack of bone meal on me. So let's just go ahead and right click this boy a number of times. And there you go. We have a full mangrove tree that's generated. And look at that, we actually have these roots that are generated underwater and the wood doesn't even start until up here. So you know what, let me go ahead and settle down and break some of these roots. Takes a little while because I am the water. Oh wow, that, that still took longer than I expected. But yeah, the roots right there are another unique block that comes along with the mangrove tree. If we get out of the water, it's a little bit easier to break. Now I will also go ahead and give myself a hoe real quick because I believe that is the tool of choice for mangrove roots. And ooh, I accidentally got that dedication, whoops. Or I accidentally got that enchantment, whoops. <laughs> but uh, let me just go ahead and use it. Oh, interesting, maybe it's not the tool of choice. Okay, hold on, let me check. So I actually got it wrong. The tool of choice for these roots is an axe, which does make sense. You know, roots in real life are pretty similar to the wood of the trees that they have. So there you go. That's how you get those quickly. Although they will drop even if you just use your hands and it's not, it doesn't take all that long to break them. But yeah, I can go ahead and just chop down this little mangrove tree right here. It is a little bit difficult since this one is in the water, but they do work like normal trees. If you break all the logs, the leaves will start to despawn. However, unlike other trees, you won't get these propagules from the leaves breaking themselves. I.e. what you'll actually get them from is, if this is a fully generated propagule right here, you go ahead and break the block, and it drops off the bottom like that. So, it didn't come from the actual block, but you only get the propagules from these literal, you know, propagule items themselves. So if I break that, since it was fully grown, it'll go ahead and give me a propagule. Now, I'm not sure what a, uh, a baby propagule, so to speak, quite looks like. Let's go ahead and take a little look there. Okay, yeah, so that's one of the earlier stages of propagule. And let me go ahead and grab some more bone meal just to see. Okay, if bone meal it a little bit. There you go. That is a full-grown mangrove swamp. Okay. So essentially, you didn't see a change in the state of the mangrove propagule once I placed it on the ground and started bone mealing, but you can only pick these guys up when they're hanging from the trees like this if they are at 8 equals 4. So let me go ahead and do F3. Oh, come on, F3, there we go. If you look all the way on the right of the screen, 8 equals 4. So let's see, uh, is there another propagule that I can look at? Oh, that screen takes up so much space. Okay. This one looks a little bit younger, I think. Okay, yes, there we go. Age equals two. So let's go ahead and build our way up here just so I have a little platform to stand on. And then if I go back to survival mode and I break it, see, we don't get anything. So we need a full grown mangrove propagule in order to pick that up. Now, another thing you'll find in these mangrove swamp biomes is what I just did pick block on mud. If you go ahead and place mud in here, what this will let you craft is, well, first of all, you can craft muddy mangrove roots. You just combine a block of mud with some mangrove roots, and that's what the block looks like. Pretty interesting. I like that. I'm, I'm vibing with that. But you can also create, let's see, where is it? Packed mud. There you go. Packed mud. And that, as you can see, gets a little bit lighter, you know, in, in texture. Let's go ahead and grab some packed mud from the inventory. So that is what packed mud looks like as compared to normal mud. I say this is sort of more similar to what I think of as normal mud. The, the, the mud that spawns in naturally in mangrove swamps is almost so dark that it kind of resembles a stone, which for building purposes could be interesting. But yeah, over here we have packed mud, again that's crafted with normal mud and a piece of wheat, and that allows you to make mud bricks. So you take four packed mud and you uh, craft it in a, a four like that, and that gives mud bricks. And with these mud bricks, you're then able to do things like mud brick slabs, you know, mud brick stairs, all sorts of things that you'd expect from a normal stone block. That's what it kind of acts like once you turn it into packed mud. A few final notes about the different types of mud. 
both of these can be mined with specific tools or your hand. So technically if we go on over here to the mud and we just use our hand, boom, it drops the mud. But for the packed mud, a pickaxe is actually going to be the tool of choice. And for normal mud, again, you can also mine it with your hand, but a shovel is actually the tool of choice for that one. And another thing to note about normal mud is that it actually technically sinks you down a little bit. So if I go ahead and hit F3, if you look at my Y coordinate, it is at 0.875, i.e. mud doesn't count as a full block. What that means is if you uh, throw an item on top of the mud and you have a hopper underneath it, it's actually going to be able to collect. So that's a useful tool. It's uh, it's much like slow sand in that uh, effect, you know, where the player kind of sinks down. But unlike slow sand, mud does not slow you down. So that's a very interesting little trick. Uh, th the same is not true of packed mud. That is a full block. Same with any, you know, packed mud bricks or any variants of that. But it is a cool little uh, little bit of variance with normal mud. And one final thing I wanted to note about mud is, you know, I, I came over here just across the river to the plains biome. If you right click on a normal dirt block along with a coarse dirt block or a podzol, I believe, then uh, what you get is mud. So right here, I'm just right clicking with this water bottle. And I believe if I'm in survival, yeah, that uses the bottle up. But there you go. You can right click on normal dirt and turn it into mud. And one final, final thing to show you is this. If you have mud placed on top of a block with pointed dripstone underneath, i.e. you have some block here, you know, maybe it's stone, maybe it's whatever, and you have pointed dripstone coming out of that block, if this block right here is mud, it will eventually turn into clay. So technically, clay is now renewable since you can turn mud into clay through this process using pointed dripstone. Oh my god, I swear it's literally stormed or rained for like four Minecraft days straight. Let's go ahead and clear up this weather. I'm just just trying to do a little walk through here. Okay, thank you. Anyways, before I was really interrupted by the rain, one more thing, or I guess a couple more things that have been added to this update, are frogs. If I go ahead and right click here, we have the white frog spawning in, and it is the white frog because that's the warm variant. However, if I go someplace that's a little bit colder, the frog type, the, the frog color rather, will actually be different. Yep, so I've just come over here to a plains, and I've gone ahead and spawned in some frogs, and here they show up as orange. So that is the temperate type of frog. And now I've gone ahead and teleported myself to an ice spikes biome, because why not? It's pretty clearly cold here. And if I spawn these boys in here, they show up green. Very cool. Wow, I like this green color a lot. These guys are very pretty. Their little ribbit mouths going. But yeah, they are very chilly, but you know what? I mean, the green frogs seem to be enjoying it. And as you can see here, you know, these frogs do also like to hop around, and that is one of their primary behaviors. They will uh, jump, croak, swim, and slowly walk on land, and, and we've been seeing a little bit of jumping right here. But yeah, these guys are comfortable both on the land and in the water. They are able to jump over five blocks tall. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was a pretty beefy jump right there. <laughs> and uh, they're actually a little bit faster in water than on land, so I wonder if I can go ahead and give you a little demonstration of that if we come down here. Yeah, I just went ahead and TP'd myself to a nice snowy area. But yeah, if we spawn a frog in the water, I'm sure he'll be very, very comfortable here as well. Oh, interesting. So they both actually wanted to go to land first, but then they hopped right back in the water to swim around. So yeah, these guys are comfortable in, you know, both water and land. Now, these guys, similar to a lot of other passive mobs in the game, can actually be bred, and the way that they are bred is with slime balls. So as you can see, if I'm holding a slime ball in my inventory here and these guys start crawling towards me, go ahead and right click and right click. And okay, my particles have actually been turned off, but if I go ahead and turn those back on, they are going to go ahead and uh, look at each other, and I guess that's all they needed. So they have gone ahead and spawned up these tadpole eggs. And technically, these right here aren't really, you know, tadpole eggs. I just couldn't remember what they were called. Technically, they're called frog spawn. These can only be placed on water with at least one air block above them, and they take up to 10 minutes to hatch into tadpoles. Also, a side note here, these guys are uh, unobtainable in survival mode. You know, the, the only way to get them in survival is to mate two frogs together, then they'll come to some water, lay down their eggs. Alright, well, as you can hopefully see there in the water, we now have some little tadpoles swimming around.
So yeah, again, these guys can spawn in groups of up to uh, of two to six from those frog spawn eggs, and yeah, they they unlike frogs can only be in the water. They will just flop around like a fish on land and eventually die, and they unlike frogs will be hunted by axolotl too. So if you need to protect them, you know, just make sure to keep that in mind. But yeah. These guys will eventually mature into frogs. Their progress towards doing so, I believe, can be sped up towards slime balls. Yep, that's right. If you go ahead and right-click them, you get those particle effects. So hopefully this guy will mature nice and quickly. But yeah, what type of frog they turn into depends on the biome in which they mature. So right now, what are we in? We are in... Uh, oh god, there's so many info. Okay, we are in a river biome. So yeah, I'm actually not sure, technically... Oh, there you go. I guess he turns into an orange frog, and yeah, interesting. I also saw a little bug with the subtitles there, which is funny. But yeah, so I, I guess in a river biome, they turn into the orange frogs, and you can speed up their process of growing into an adult with slime balls, much the same way that you can uh, breed these guys using slime balls. Now, I believe the final interesting thing that we want to mention about frogs is how they interact with two other mobs, specifically magma cubes and slime. So I will go ahead and spawn a couple of frogs in right here, just so they're right near them. But yeah, if I go ahead and spawn in a big magma cube like that, do they eat the big guys, or do they only eat the smaller ones? Don't be shy. There we go, okay. So he just ate one of the little baby magma cubes, and what we got was an ochre frog light. And the type of frog light that you get from a frog eating one of the magma cubes depends on what type of frog it is. Since this guy is a temperate frog, he goes ahead and spawns in this right here, this ochre frog light. And to me, this looks a lot like the sea lantern, but yeah, it's a, it's basically just another option for lighting. And you know what? I, It's a bit of a unique mechanic, but I do like this block. I think it's a pretty useful and, and cool thing, and setting up farms for this is very, very interesting. Now, I did also mention, I believe, that these guys can eat slimes. So, yeah, let's just spawn in a baby slime real quick for them to get a lick. Come on, I think I think it does have to be the babies, which makes sense. Oh, you gonna go for him? Here's a baby. Come on. Oh, yeah, he's coming over. And there you go. It's such a funny animation. But, yeah, I guess these frogs, it, if you want, could potentially be used in some kind of slime farm to be a pretty efficient killing mechanism. But yeah, just to give another example of a different type of frog light, there we go. This is a cold weather frog, and he spawns in a verdant frog light. That's a bit of a greener one. So, you know, you can see they're sort of tinged with the uh, same type of color as the frog. And yeah, these guys, they offer up a lot of light, which is why the, uh, you know, the, the ice is starting to melt beneath them, since that's the mechanic with how ice works. And I believe, yeah, they offer 15... Or, no, sorry. They offer 14 block lights. So these guys are very, very bright, which is why they're quickly starting to uh, melt the ice right here. Let me go ahead and show you the warm weather frog light. But I tell you, these biomes are not super common. I've had to go thousands and thousands of blocks away. But yeah, this is a nice example of a swamp that happens to be a, a lot more swampy. You know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot more water here as opposed to real land, which is, a, you know, a cool little thing. I, I appreciate that change about this biome in particular. However, let me go ahead and get to some land. We will spawn in... Oh, interesting. Oh, that was a river biome. Okay. There we go. Well, well, now we got a white frog, and let's spawn in some magma. Let's get a baby in there. And come on. Come on, give him a lick. There we go. And that is the third type of frog light, the pearlescent frog light. Oh, very nice. I, I like these names. They're so descriptive. But yeah, there you go. It's got it's mostly white with a little bit of a purple tinge. So that's interesting. I I I kind of like that. But yeah, so these right here are the three different types of frog light. They, as you can see, are placed directionally. So they have a, a little bit of you know this one looks like it's horizontal, or sorry, this one looks like it's vertical. This one looks like it's horizontal. That kind of thing. But yeah, I I do like what these blocks offer in terms of you know a, just another lighting source. Also, one final thing that's kind of cute to mention, if I go ahead and spawn in some more tadpoles and I grab a bucket, these guys are actually part of the crew that can be, uh, well, obtained in a bucket. So let me go ahead and just do this. Where are my tadpoles at? Right click. And boom, we now have a tadpole. We, we now have a bucket of tadpole. Look at that art. It is adorable. <laughs> Those enormous eyes. I love it. So yeah, if we go ahead and just right click on a block like this, Boom, Tadpole spawns out, and uh, since he's in the water, he's good. Finally, the last big change that I want to talk about from this update 
is what I'm holding in my hand right now, the LA. These guys were the winner of the mob vote at the most recent Minecon, and to tell you the truth, this is definitely the mob I was pulling for. I think these guys have so many practical applications, because what they do is basically pick up items that are on the ground and help bring them to you. So to do that, what you need to do is right click on them with a certain kind of block. So I just right clicked on him with grass, and you can see he's holding that in his hands right now. Now let me go over to his friends right here. They, uh, they did a little bit of wandering. But let me get them. And as you can see from their friend who, who I right clicked on before, once you give them an item, they'll typically follow you around like pets. And these guys are actually pretty quick. As long as you're not in the air, you know, flying with rockets, they'll do a pretty good job of keeping up with you. So that is definitely a plus. But yeah, what these guys do is once they're holding a specific item, let me go ahead and uh, get some more. What you can then do is just throw it all on the ground, you know, just like this. Toss a bunch of grass everywhere. And what they'll do is go around and pick up those grass items. And once they found, you know, all the grass in the area, once their pathfinding can't find any more, they'll run back over to you and toss it to you, which is why I just got that achievement. So there we go. The full rest of the stack that I didn't have, they just handed it back to me. That's what these guys do. They find items on the ground, and if it matches what you've given them to hold in their hands, they'll bring it to you. I am a big, big fan of what this potentially means for farms. However, there are some limitations. For example, if you don't want them to bring the items directly to you, but instead you want them to bring them to a specific location, what you can do is play a note block nearby them. There we go. So you saw those little vibrations going out. Let me do it again. Yep, all those vibrations went out to all three of those LAs, which means that this is now their preferred note block. So what I'm going to do is, you know, sprinkle these grass blocks around again, since that's the block they're locked to. And once they finish picking up all the grass blocks in the area, let's go ahead and see what they do. There you go. They will toss them over to the note block. Now, the thing with these guys is they're not super super particular with where they toss it so if you're trying to do some kind of setup where you have hoppers on the ground around it which you know makes sense that that'd be a pretty logical uh, thing to do in this area it can be a little bit difficult to get the exact location right however one thing i've seen is uh people pushing minecart hoppers into this note block that way you know it's 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 hitbox is liable to pick up items that might be anywhere around it or on top so that's a pretty useful idea however as you can see there by the end if I go ahead and do this again, since it's been more than 30 seconds, they will no longer bring the grass blocks to the note block. They will bring the grass blocks to me. And that's because the grass block locking thing only lasts for 30 seconds. So if I want the LA to bring a grass block to the note block again, I've got to right click it one more time. Otherwise, they're just going to start bringing it back to me. So that is a bit of a limitation with DLAs that can be a little difficult. You'll have to make sure that the note block gets triggered at least once every 30 seconds if you want them to stay locked on it. However, that's not, you know, necessarily a huge problem. Clocks are a big thing in Minecraft and interesting. Okay, so I guess those two didn't hear the vibrations. Let me do it again. There you go. So they're all very aware of it now. So I will do this one more time. Just toss a bunch of grass on the floor. And once they finish picking it all up, they should, instead of giving it to me, give it to the note block. Yep, there you go. However, if I were to wait another 30 seconds and toss the grass on the floor again, they'd bring it to me. So that's something to keep in mind with these guys. However, they are a super, super useful mob nonetheless. Another nice thing about these guys is that they actually naturally regenerate health, since, you know, they're relatively rare, and we'll talk about where you find them in a second. Since they're relatively rare and somewhat hard to find, they naturally regenerate health, which is great. They actually naturally regenerate two health points a second, which is one full heart, and they have 10 full health points. So as much health as the player, and they regenerate one heart per second. So that's very, very handy, unless you have a warden chasing them, like, you know, we saw at the beginning of this video. That makes it a lot more difficult for them to die. One of the main two spots where you can find these guys is actually in the Woodland Mansion. And as you can see here, they're actually being kept inside these little cages, which... Man, that's, that's, that's very hard to watch, you know? You just see these little blue guys floating inside these prison cells, and there's an evoker guarding them. But yeah, if you, uh, you know, take care of the evoker in survival mode, you can get inside here. All you need to do is then right-click on these guys with an item, and boom, perfect. And then they will follow you around forever. So you can break them out, you know, we can do the same with this guy right here. Boom, break him out. Boom, break him out. Oh, no one in here, okay. 
and boom break this guy out he's got a bigger prison cell so yeah those are the main two locations that you can find these guys as of now they'll naturally generate at these woodland mansions and at some pillager outposts and here at these woodland mansions they'll be in these little stone cages at pillager outposts they'll be in similar cages just ones that are made out of wood so uh yeah, these guys are, are definitely a very useful and interesting new addition to the game, and I'm really excited to see what some of the technical community are able to do with their capabilities. One final note, as of right now there's nothing official about it, but in future editions I believe they are making these guys duplicable. I, I think it's something to do with an amethyst shard and a, a jukebox, I believe. But yeah, um, that is, uh, that's not something that currently exists, but in future editions that's something to certainly look out for. But alright everyone. With that said, I think we have just about covered all the major new changes in this update. Of course, there are a few more subtle changes, and if you want to learn more about those, you can always go ahead and check out the wiki. There are uh, you know, a plenty of small texture changes, as well as a change with how mobs spawn in the nether, You know, the, the light levels that they can spawn in at. But yeah, those are the most substantial changes in this update. The deep dark, ancient cities, mangrove swamps, and a laze. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. And you know what, if you enjoyed this video, please please do consider liking and subscribing, as well as sharing with your friends. It really does help me out, and I put a lot of work into making this video. For those of you who are interested in my Let's Play, don't worry, I am hoping to be making new episodes of that soon, especially to explore all these new changes at 1.19. So with that all said, thank you all very, very much for watching, and I will see you in the next video soon.